Hello, this is Luciana Spraker with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives, and today we're going to talk a little bit about what makes Savannah unique. Specifically, I want to talk about the Oglethorpe Plan. The Oglethorpe Plan is so important to the community of Savannah and the City of Savannah government, we even have it in our logo. Just what is the Oglethorpe Plan? Well, in 1733, James Edward Oglethorpe landed in Savannah and established both the colony of Georgia and the first settlement, Savannah, and laid out our town plan. And it is named for him. And it was a very versatile, multi-purpose plan. It accommodated for house lots, civic and religious lots, public and common space. It had garden and farm lots. It provided military protection, emergency and disaster relief. And most importantly, it had a plan for growth. There are many components of the plan that we're going to talk about. The first one I want to talk about is the ward. This is the most visual um, component to the plan today, what people are most familiar with, and why so many people actually come to Savannah to visit. There are several parts to the ward, the squares, the trust lots, the tithings and building lots, the streets and the lanes. The squares are a public space. They were originally for public gatherings, meetings, markets. They provided emergency shelter and evacuation space, and they were where the military practiced their drills. The trust lots were large building lots to the east and the west of the squares, and they were used for our public buildings, civic and government buildings like the courthouse, the filature, where they would wind silk, because we had hoped that Georgia was going to be a silk producing colony, the public oven, the public store. This is also where they would have the religious buildings or churches. Christ Church, the first church in Georgia, was built on a trust lot. The tithings were the blocks to the north and south of the square where we broke out our building lots. So each tithing is divided into 10 building lots. So each ward had 40 building lots, and here the colonists built their residences. Each ward is divided by a system of streets and lanes. The streets are your major public right-of-ways, and they run both east and west and north and south around the squares. And then the lanes are more informal utilitarian service alleys that bisect just the tithings. These are meant just for the use of those um, people who have building lots on the tithings. And they are really help create a subworld of backdoor access. And they've been become very important because they allow us to have utilities and sanitation and all these support functions that we need that we can sort of hide at the back door that we don't have to have out in the front. Ward modules also allowed for growth as needed. We could add on as town and population grew. And each ward was basically a neighborhood within itself. So when the city government was established in 1789 and we had our first elections, we actually um, elected aldermen by ward. So each ward would elect an alderman to city council. And here here you can see how we add on the wards to build the town up. General Oglethorpe laid out the first four wards in 1733, which can be seen in this view from 1734. Those first wards included the squares of Johnson, Wright, Ellis, and Telfair. Their Telfair was originally called St. James. You can see here in this view that land has been surveyed and they're starting to build the first residences on the building lots and the tithings and a few buildings on the trust lots around Johnson Square in the lower left.
These diagrams show how the ward system was built up over time from those first four wards in 1733, shown in the upper left, until the full expression of the ward system in the 1850s with 24 wards and therefore 24 squares in the lower right. The next major component of the Oglethorpe Plan is the town common. The common was public land that could be used by all the colonists for grazing their animals. It also ended up being used for the growth, for the addition of those wards. You can see here that the east and the west commons were the first areas that were extended into, and then they started moving south. So in this map, which is from 1818, there's basically no East and no West Common left. By the 1850s, and this is an 1853 map by Edward Vincent, there was no Common left at all, including the South Common. Under the trustees' management of the colony of Georgia, each colonist received not only their tithing lot to build their home, but also a garden lot and a farm lot outside of the town walls. The garden lot was a small, triangular, five-acre lot. It was closer to town and was used to grow the food they needed for their family to eat and survive. The farm lot was a much larger, square, 45-acre lot. It was further out and used for large-scale farming for the colonists to produce crops with which they could make money. So each colonist actually received three lots, a building lot, a garden lot, and a farm lot. In the plan, they were all named and numbered to go together. When the trustees relinquished the colony's charter to the king in 1750, this system broke down, and the king started issuing crown grants to individuals, which were much larger tracts of land. But you can still see remnants of the diagonals of the triangular garden lots in many of our streets and lots downtown. Georgia was considered a military agrarian colony. Agrarian for the farming aspect built into the design and military for its defense aspect. Moving, moving further out from the farm lots, Oglethorpe laid out a system of outposts and villages designed to protect the colony and the town of Savannah. He was concerned about invasion from Spanish Florida to the south. Here you see a close-up of that same 1735 map. You can see the downtown wards, garden lots, farm lots, and then they surveyed out a grid that was intended to be a series of one square mile of villages, of which only Highgate and Hampstead were developed. They were designed with central circles, similar to the central squares downtown, and then large pie-like tracks radiating out. These were the agrarian villages meant to be farming communities. Then he had military outposts like Thunderbolt on the Wilmington River established as a lookout to watch for ships coming in from the south, from the south and Florida. And you can see Thunderbolt is indicated by the flag, and the Wilmington River is indicated on this map as Augustine Creek. But this is a diagram because it shows how this grid system led to our current system of streets and gives us some perspective of where all this actually was. Most of you can orient yourself to Bull Street and Montgomery Crossroads. And the villages of Highgate and Hampstead are now land on the Hunter Army Airfield Post. Going back downtown, Savannah was built on the Yamacraw Bluff, named for the Yamacraw Indians who occupied this land when Oglethorpe and the colonists arrived. The port of Savannah was built along the bluff with a series of wharves and docks and warehouses. At the top of the bluff, a park-like area called the Strand developed and the city planted a row of trees. This early 1802 map shows the trees along the Strand. In 1810, Savannah passed our first ordinance for the protection of trees one of the earliest documented in the country. Oglethorpe could not have envisioned all the changes that have occurred in Savannah over the last centuries as technology has evolved, pushing our buildings upward and moving from horses to the automobile. 
But what is wonderful about his town plan is its ability to adapt to these changes. Not only was the city able to add on to it as the population grew, but the squares have evolved in their use to support the town and, and its needs. No longer are they used for military drilling, but as passive parks supporting an impressive urban forest that most cities would love to have. They provide traffic calming, slowing down automobiles by acting like traffic circles. The plan's grid system of streets easily lends itself to one-way streets to manage the flow of traffic. As I mentioned, the regional extension of the Oglethorpe plan, including the garden, farm, and village lots, was abandoned under the Crown Colony after 1750. But the ward system continued as the city grew, with new wards added as needed. Unfortunately, in the 1850s, the city abandoned the traditional ward module with Central Square. In 1851, the city established Forsyth Place, a very early, large-scale municipal park. Forsyth is even older than Central Park in New York City, which wasn't established until 1853. You can think of Forsyth Place, now called Forsyth Park, as our ultimate square, at the foot of our Bull Street line of squares. It features a central fountain, considered by some as the first monumental fountain in the United States. Though Forsyth does not fit in the Oglethorpe plan, it is an important part of our system of downtown green space established by Oglethorpe with the squares. I think you will agree that the Oglethorpe plan is one of the main things that makes Savannah such a special place to live and visit. And I want to thank Dr. Robin Williams and Dr. David Goebel, who have both um, contributed immensely to this presentation. Um, Dr. Williams presented a history of Savannah at the cutting edge, and Dr. Goebel, mapping and designing Savannah, which provided both images and content for our presentation today. Thank you for joining us for What Makes Savannah Unique, the Oglethorpe Plan, and we look forward to having you again for another Hungry for History with the City of Savannah Municipal Archives. Thank you.